Hey guys, Kid Eye Kino here. We're now a long way from the golden age of the kaiju genre, with Daie finally going under and Godzilla now headlining the Champion Festival. Luckily, while Godzilla's budgets were slashed pretty severely thanks to the continuing decline of the Japanese film industry, even down to the last three films in the original series, they remain pretty solid entertainment. First up, we have Godzilla vs. Megalon, another Jun Fukuda joint. I think this one is where the series' low budgets became really the most obvious. It uses as much stock footage as Godzilla vs. Gigan did, if not more. Some of it actually taken from the new special effects scenes in that film. I don't think there's a single bit of new footage that takes place in a city, and the final battle all takes place in a vague countryside location. What struck me on this rewatch was how much this film reminded me of TV tokusatsu. For instance, a lot of the film is shot outside, seemingly during the winter, in the kind of nondescript rock quarries and mountainsides you see all the time on Super Sentai, or more contemporaneously, Tsuburaya Productions' no-budget series Redman. These sequences include a good deal of car chases, which would have been cheaper to shoot than miniature set pieces, and there are also things like this really simple shot showing Megalon burrowing to the Earth's surface from deep underground. It's a clearly low-tech effect that reminds me of the simple forced perspective kind of camera tricks you see all the time in Sentai. And I guess this is all pretty appropriate considering the focus on Jet Jaguar, who is clearly based on popular Kyodai heroes from TV series like Ultraman. I have to admit though, this is one of my favorite Godzilla films, warts and all. Riichiro Manabe, the composer for Godzilla vs. Hedera, lends it a perfectly bombastic and upbeat musical style that suits the material perfectly. I love the Godzilla suit for this one. He looks really friendly, and the new suit actor who stepped in after Haruo Nakajima left the series really plays him as kind of a superhero. It all works together really well. And the new special effect scenes are often pretty commendable. The lake draining and Megalon's attack on the dam in particular really stand out. This is a film that, yeah, isn't really aiming that high, but it absolutely nails what it is going for. Next up, there's Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. This one has some pretty interesting stuff going on, but there are other things about it that I've really never cared for. On the one hand, Mechagodzilla is an iconic monster, and it's a concept I'm surprised took so long to show up in the Godzilla series after King Kong escapes. A monster with so many beam and projectile attacks also gives Teriyoshi Nakano a chance to flex with the pyrotechnics. It's good to see Hiroshi Koizumi and Akihiko Hirata back. I like the intrigue between the Interpol agents and the aliens with the the protagonists caught in the middle. Jun Fukuda does that really well, as one would expect given his background in spy movies and crime thrillers. Masaru Sato is also back to score this one. There are parts of the score that I find kind of forgettable, but there are a few big jazzy cues that are just absolute knockouts. On the other hand, like I said, there are other things about this movie that I've never cared for. For one thing, there are just so many characters in this thing. You've got Keisuke, his brother, the archaeologist, Koizumi, Hirata, Hirata's daughter, two Interpol agents, and they're all off in different places for most of the film. This rewatch is the first time I remember being able to keep them all straight, and it took a considerable amount of conscious effort. Second, there's the whole ancient prophecy related to the monster's appearance. It talks about signs like a black mountain in the sky, a red moon, and the sun rising in the west. The mountain turns out to be a black cloud formation, and the sun in the west is a mirage, but no explanation is given as to why these things happen, or how the ancient Okinawans who wrote the prophecy could possibly have predicted them. Also, Miyarabi's prayer really could have been cut down to one verse. It's got a big, climactic chorus, but then the music keeps going and you realize it's going into another verse, and the chorus is a lot less effective the second time. These pet peeves are why I really prefer the follow-up Terror of Mechagodzilla. It's definitely a mixed bag. Ishiro Honda and Akira Ifukube are back, but you can really tell how constrained Honda was on this one when you compare it to his previous work. The editing in particular seems a bit rushed, and at times I can't help but wonder if Honda was able to get enough coverage during filming. There's a scene where Mafune's groundskeeper is spying on Katsura and Ichinose, but he's cut in really awkwardly in brief inserts. 
There's a scene where Godzilla appears just as Titanosaurus is about to step on some kids, but we never actually see what happens to them or if they get away. There are also some weird edits during the monster battles. I still don't know how Godzilla goes from tackling Mechagodzilla here to being on the ground over there. That said, there's some really good stuff happening here too. Nakano is in his element here with some really great pyrotechnics work, including one spectacular shot where the whole set is shaken and torn apart. He also manages a really impressive sense of scale in a few shots by shooting the monsters from below with a wide-angle lens. This one also has a new screenwriter on board, Yukiko Takayama, to date the only woman to receive sole screenwriting credit on a Godzilla film. She adds a novel and compelling tragic romance to the mix, and there's some interesting themes involving bodily autonomy going on with Katsura. Maybe that's a future video. There's also Dr. Mifune. It's a simple joy to see Akihiko Hirata hamming it up as a mad scientist, though it is a bit sad that this was his last appearance in the series. It's also interesting that in the two Mechagodzilla films, he first plays a scientist coerced into helping repair Mechagodzilla, and then in the second film plays a bitter vengeful one willingly joining forces with the aliens. All in all, though it was never really intended as such, this film makes a pretty good finale to the original Godzilla series. Meanwhile, just as kaiju films were dying out in Japan, Dino De Laurentiis was working with Paramount in America on a remake of King Kong. Two months before that film was released, Jack H. Harris, the producer behind The Blob and Dinosaurus, distributed a much smaller production to American theaters, director Paul Leder's Ape. What's really interesting about this one to me is that, yes, it's obviously a no-budget production full of really absurd moments that's riding the coattails of a much better made film, but it's impossible to tell how much of it was really serious. Supposedly, Paul Leder initially took the production seriously, but realized he had a disastrously bad film on his hands after reviewing some early footage and took a more tongue-in-cheek approach for the remainder of the production. It makes sense. It seems like once Leader found the funding for his project in South Korea, he first tried to get the most out of his 20 odd thousand dollar budget, shooting in 3D and prominently featuring actual military and fire departments, complete with a thank you to the US Army in the opening credits, as if American soldiers hadn't committed enough atrocities on the peninsula already. But a lot of the film also feels really jokey, the rendering of the title is an obvious reference to the Korean War satire MASH, there's the comically Chad-like portrayal of reporter Tom Rose having an ongoing affair with this famous actress and being instantly known to both the American and Korean military brass. Come on, Colonel, I don't think you're owning up to the seriousness of the situation. Now that kind of alarmist talk, Mr. Rose, will just tend to exacerbate the situation. Captain Kim, you remember me? Oh yes, Tom Rose, how are you? The blowhard American Colonel is just hilarious. The hell with the press. I'm gonna smoke this goddamn cigarette. What the hell are you looking at? My fly unzipped or something? And yeah, you know, there's this. It's a fun but definitely kind of maddening watch. Even uh, Chris Alexander on the Blu-ray commentary reports becoming, you know, more and more delirious as the film goes on. Finally though, we come to Dino De Laurentiis's King Kong. Some people are really harsh on this one, and it has its flaws, but I still find plenty to appreciate here. It tries and mostly succeeds to be a huge event, with some gorgeous locations, great production value, and pretty solid effects. It specifically tries to be a more kind of modern and self-aware take on the kind of colonial fantasy the original was, with Charles Grodin as the callous industrialist, and Jeff Bridges as the conscientious but self-righteous environmentalist. Jessica Lange apparently was a model with no training as an actress at the time, but she's playing kind of a naive wannabe actress here, so it honestly works fine if you ask me. The relationship between her and Jeff Bridges' Jack is nicely fleshed out, with the extended TV version apparently containing a little more development for them. Also, John Barry's score for this film is magnificent, and he was honestly the perfect choice for the type of film this was trying to be. 
This film is definitely not without its downsides though. Rick Baker's ape suit is generally great and very expressive, but the mask with the smile looks goofy as hell. The incredibly hubristic life-size Kong animatronic sticks out like a sore thumb and it's only in the movie about three seconds. The composite effects are frequently very weak. The more grounded approach and focus on character and social commentary come at the expense of Skull Island being a less fantastical mythic place. There's no dinosaurs or anything, so the rescue party is only ever menaced by Kong. The log bridge scene is a lot weaker than the original, and the giant snake fight is more clearly just happening for plot reasons than trying to deliver on spectacle like its original equivalent. I will say that the climax in this version on the World Trade Center is great, especially the halting mechanical movements of the Gatling guns taking aim on the helicopter's approach. It's really ominous, it's really effective. And with that, we're officially halfway through, bringing it full circle with a remake of the movie we started with. Next time we'll see the Shaw Brothers' answer to Kong, Gamera's post-mortem spasm, Godzilla's revival, the return of Raymond Burr, and North Korea's only foray into the kaiju genre. Until then, thanks to my patrons, especially Exploder Button, John Paneer, and Ryan Clark. You can become a patron at the link in the description. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.